This is going to be on the content of the kind of existential risk, where are we? Um, this is not going to be getting into um, nitty gritty kind of strategic or tactical assessments of things. This is more meta conceptual ways to think about our thinking, right? So hopefully that wherever we are, um, we can come to better conclusions for ourselves and the people we lead. Okay, and then I and I and I want to try and lay as many of our cards on the table now, so that everything's transparent and you can triangulate for yourselves. Um, principled stands we take. We are uh, huge fans of um, encouraging self-authoring versus socially defined behaviors. Uh, that comes out of developmental psychology. Many of you are probably already familiar with that. But socially defined is I'm following scripts. Uh, the first ones that everybody comes up with is, you know, what I was born and raised into. Uh, get a job, get a car, get a degree, you know, marry the, get the nice wife, you know, wife or husband, the house, the car, etc. Um, many of us then break out of that socially defined script, but then we just go straight into another one. You know, and now it's groovy, conchy culture, and now it's trying to be enlightened and use our whisper talk voices and make uncomfortably long eye contact, whatever it would be. It's still socially defined, um, even though we think it's liberated. Even punks are remarkably conformist. All right, so the question is, is how do we support constructivist action learning in service of self-authoring behavior, which basically means, uh, and the Russian educational theorist Vygotsky uh, had a, had a, has a great concept known as scaffolding. And scaffolding are those tools or training wheels that help support and guide and enhance our intelligence. Uh, and one of our colleagues at Harvard, Zach Stein, has done some fascinating work on that, basically saying intelligence is absolutely plastic, it's not a fixed thing, and it depends entirely on the scaffolding. All right, so for instance, you can have somebody take an intelligence test and they'll score a three out of five. But then you introduce the notion of a mind map. And you're like, hey, draw and scribble for half an hour. Organize your thoughts. Understand you know, linear and nonlinear connections between them. Test again, they can score a five. A dyslexic with spell check on their MacBook right, presents as an entirely different level of social intelligence. So all we're going to be trying to do is share some scaffolding, right, that helps. Okay? And then finally, the other thing is we'll say, um, we do take a stand. Um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the U.S. Supreme Court Justice way back when, uh, had a great phrase. He said, I don't give a fig for the simplicity on this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity. So what we would advocate is that the spectrum of where we all come down on what's to be done, you know, where are we, what's happening, and what's to be done, is entirely our sovereign choice. But we would absolutely advocate that a more considered position is better than a less considered position. Cool? All right. So with that said, now, can you guys even see this? This is pretty darn washed out. Um, but basically, this, was a, this is a line from the Talking Heads. We'll probably trot out the song at some point, Nothing But Flowers. I don't know if you guys ever remember that, but I do remember back in college being baked as fuck listening to this line and, and you know, dancing a little ditty and said, and as things fell apart, nobody paid much attention. And that really uh, rung true then. Uh, it seemingly uh, has been true for quite some time. Um, something might be changing lately, and it feels like more of us are starting to pay attention and notice that. So the question is, is um, mapping and modeling. How do we take a look at things? So um, I, I think I opened our, our talk on Thursday night with this same quote from Buckminster Fuller because it's, it gets us to the point where he says, quite clearly, our task is predominantly metaphysical, for it is how to get all of humanity to educate itself swiftly enough to generate spontaneous social behaviors that will avoid extinction. Now, he read that half a century ago. Sure, he was on time. Right? There were many, many things he was well ahead of the curve on. So this is not to say New Age escapism, right? that we just get to all keep going to our Vipassana retreats and hope that that will sort it. But it is to say, hey, we're, sh we're in a shared project here of how do we get this done. So um, I'm just going to share some potential assertions I want to make very clear that's all they are. Uh, you are f absolutely free to agree, disagree, challenge, refine, iterate. Okay, but this is just kind of, again, to the laying the cards. The first is that um, 
things are likely to destabilize before they recohere. Um, I'm sure many of us are following the science and the research, but there are certain cats that are squarely out of the bag and we are not getting them back before there will be some degradation in conditions, which is important when we start thinking about potential solutions, because if a solution is, lies above the level of evolutionary biological encoding, meaning me looking after myself and my family and at a maximum my tribe, that is an, a fragile solution. If it requires us sitting in a circle and smoking 5-MeO-DMT until we all assemble galactic Voltron, who will save the day, that is a fragile solution. All right, so we need to just be constantly scanning what actually gets done. Um, quick round of acronym quizzes. Does anybody know that first one? T.O. Twaki? Anybody know what that means? Where are we? Yes, good old Michael Stipe, R.E.M. These guys had it in the 80s, man. Um, the end of the world as we know it. How about the next one? Y-O-Y-O, yo-yo. You're on your own, as San Francisco is finding out repeatedly in this last month with PG&E and the power grid. W-T-S-H-T-F, it's a pretty easy one. When the shit hits the fan, okay? And the last one, I actually saw this on a bumper sticker in my neighborhood. We were walking our dog and I'm like, oh dear God, there's one of them right next to us. W-W-G-O-W-G-A. Yes, ding, 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 ding. Where we go one, we go all, which actually sounds pretty baller until you realize it's the alt-right 4chan whack nuts of QAnon who have this as their rallying cry. Retreated by Donald Trump Jr., by the way. So these are the acronyms that are on the message boards. These are the acronyms that circulate in prepper land. In fact, Nat Geo, if you want something sobering as far as what's in the zeitgeist, um, on, in the upside down, right? Not gatherings like this. Uh, National Geographic in 2011 debuted a film, a series called Doomsday Preppers, right? And it, it outpaces Stephen Colbert. It is, the, it is the most watched show that National Geographic has ever had in history. And they didn't understand it. It was a complete surprise breakout hit. And, and then they went and surveyed their audience and they realized that now more Americans believe it is better to invest, to cash out of their 401ks and invest in MREs meals ready to eat, like military rations, right? basically canned goods and prepping over 401ks, white picket fences, and upward aspirational mobility. So this is the conversation that is happening on the other side of the divide right? that we find ourselves on socially and politically right now. Right? And if we'd like to think that the conscious folks walking around Shoreditch and Brooklyn and Venice Beach are the ones that are going to carry the day with their man buns and their bone broth. We are, hey, dude, you know what I mean? Right? Uh, we're sorely mistaken. There's folks that have been at this for a decade. Right? There's conferences, there's gatherings, like, right? And the question is, if we want to talk about like the Scandinavian seed bank, right? The idea of like keeping all the heirloom seeds and storing them so that in the event of disintegration, there's a chance to reseed the garden, we ought to be thinking of that culturally as well. Right? Because right now, the seeds of culture that are best, best positioned to persist are not that pro-social. The Mormon church has actually been actively buying up acreage, tens of thousands of acres in Vermont, New Hampshire, Utah, Northern Idaho, and setting up viability cities already. So, I mean, not to create us and them situations, but just to understand there are lots of folks that are taking this far more proactively and tactically than almost anybody on the Kanchi progressive side. So these are just um, a few 
books that if you haven't come across them um, can be helpful. None of them are definitive, um, but they are representative of certain genres and they are also helpful to be sharing with others. So my assumption, I'm, I'm going to try and make everything explicit anytime we're, I'm not just sort of stating a neutral fact. So my assumption is that you wouldn't be here today if you weren't already actively self-educating, but that one of the challenges in most of our lives is then how do I communicate and enroll people around me without freaking them the fuck out, alienating them, doing whatever, right? So what skillful means right, in building consensus around where are we and what's next, right? So the first one, just to give you a quick thing, Bill McKibben is, uh, in fact, his organization, is it 355? I think it is, which is parts per million. That's where we need to get back to. So that's the naming of his, his organization. He is a, he's a MacArthur genius. He's a long-term professor and eco-philosopher and now activist. He's sort of, after calling this out for decades, he's like, all right, we got to do stuff. You know, the time for talking is done. Um, and his newest book, Falter, um, which is Has the Human Game Begun to Play Itself Out, is uh, you know, current and thoughtful and considered and pro-social reading. So it's not alarmist, it's not doom and gloom. If you want the TLDR, there's a good article in Rolling Stone uh, that came out three months ago when his book launched. So you could read that. The next one, Jared Diamond, Pulitzer Prize winner of the book Guns, Germs, and Steel. Many of you may be familiar with this. This is the third. His middling book in that trilogy was called Collapse, which sort of speaks for itself. Upheaval is a cross-political analysis of countries, everything from Chile to Poland and Hungary to then, you know, coming to the U.S. and the U.K. today. Um, and so it's a cross-cultural analysis of resiliency and fragility uh, in basically contemporary democratic systems. Uh, and so that too is helpful. It's, I didn't personally find it as like riveting as I was hoping it was going to be, but nonetheless, it's Jared Diamond, right? So you've got high signal and legibility and you can put it in people's hands. You can quote from him, et cetera. The next one is, uh, I'll, I'll actually skip one and go to the knowledge. Lewis Dartnell is a, is a PhD who worked with NASA and I think he's actually UK based, but it was on Mars colonization. And so he's deeply been deeply into how do you establish resilient and anti-fragile uh, community systems, infrastructure, and support. And this book is fascinating. It's called How to Rebuild Civilization in the Aftermath of a Cataclysm. So it's an extended thought experiment on what happens when you experience a drop of one third of the population. And then what do you need? Literally like alchemy and, I mean, alchemy. What's the word I was looking for? Smelters, metalwork, metallurgy, that was it, it was close. Um, metallurgy, food sources, all these kinds of things. I mean, it actually would make the most amazing science curriculum for high school kids I could possibly think of. It is so cool, it is so hands-on, it is in-depth, it would give kids the chance, and we can come back to this about what, does, what do resilient communities might they look like, you know, but that's a fascinating, fascinating book. And the final one is Neil Strauss, on his extended redemption tour after writing the game uh, about pickup artistry. Uh, this was his, his experience post 9-11 and post 2008 collapse. And he got kind of freaked out that he's like, holy shit, you know, like I'm a clueless urban zoo animal. Um, I'm dead meat if this thing goes tits up. And so he embarked on a sort of really fascinating two or three year journey to become anti-fragile himself. And he studied everything from permaculture to primitive skills to urban escape and invasion to becoming an EMT and plugging in with his emergency services. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a really good read and it's uplifting because the moral was, and even dual passports, the whole bit, right? He was looking to bugger off and, and save his ass. And he said, I started out being the guy that was looking to run away from these problems. And by the end of this journey, I found myself becoming the man who is now walking towards them. So in that sense, bam, you know, it's a good galvanizer, okay? So, um, yeah, soft landing, crash landing, hard landing, water landing, TBD. But that the plane is not likely to stay on its current flight is a meaningful enough likelihood that it's important for us to wrap our heads around that, All right? The next one is, um, and we've just been riffing on it, teasing about it, um, but magical thinking of any stripe won't save us. And that's really important. 
It's really important because um, particularly, you know, yeah, in, in circles where we have access to transformational festivals, things like Burning Man, psychedelic renaissance, meditation, yoga, all of these things, there's, there's, a, there's a few pathologies that, that seem to show up. And, and one of them is the just straight up spiritual bypass. The idea, and I think I spoke a little bit about a variant of this uh, on Thursday night, which is a sort of rapture ideology. The idea that there's an inflection point coming at the, um, on the other side of the inflection point. Um, everything will be different. Therefore, we just need to fingers crossed and squint our eyes and get to the inflection point, And then we'll be saved from any of the accretive linear challenges we face. We just get to skip that somehow. And whether the skip comes from, you know, interdimensional contact and benevolent aliens saving us, whether it comes from an asymptotic blossoming or flowering of human consciousness, whether it comes from blockchain disrupting, you know, destructive late stage capitalism, whether it comes from everybody getting to do MDMA and healing their hearts. Right. And I don't mean, I, I don't, <laughs> this is not to be, you know, cynical, but this is to like, uh, this is a loving bitch slap. Right? Whether it comes from any of those things, right? the answer is probably not. Probably not. And you know, my graduate studies were very much, you know, I was going through basically environmental ecological studies like this stuff. So it came to a lot of these conclusions a long time ago based on structural things, like even just hydraulic societies. Like if you rely on irrigation, you go the way of the Egyptians, you go the way of the Anasazi, this is how it's always been. Right? And if you look at the American West, from Denver all the way out to Los Angeles, you're like, they're sticking giant straws down in aquifers that took millions of years to charge. They're sucking out all the water. They're puking them onto the surface. They're becoming salin salinated and polluted with petrochemical and you know, uh, fertilizers and pesticides. Doesn't pencil out. <laughs> we're consuming it faster than we're restoring it. That is, an, that is a terminal condition. That was, that was 20 years ago. Now, we're looking at a whole uh, additional level of um, ways we think it might be saved. And the classic is the Steven Pinker version of, of the techno-utopianism. Like actually, hey, all you naysayers, right? We've acted the new cycle, if it bleeds, it leads. That's telling us all the doom and gloom, it's a bad thing. Actually, things are getting better, and they are. Things are getting exponentially better, right? Childhood mortality, literacy, Right? Decrease in wars despite what we see in our news feeds. Right? There's all those beautiful trends, and that is the promise of the Enlightenment. Right? The trick is that there have been massive externalities to that progress and the tragedy of the commons. And so even if you take, for an example, the things like ocean acidification and warming, right? the ocean has been absorbing all the excess heat of the entire Industrial Revolution and the burning of hydrocarbons for over a century. It did it way better than we thought it possibly could. But we're actually, and now in the last two years, realizing, holy shit, there was way more latent energy stored than we knew it was doing. It was a buffer, right? And now it is actually very, very close to capacity. So when we try and wrestle with, things are getting exponentially better, but they are also getting exponentially worse. And to try and map those trends and the intersection between them in a complex, chaotic system beggars the imagination. So has anybody ever felt that pillar to post kind of thing in your social feed? Like someone will be coming from one camp and then you're like, yay, oh my gosh, I can relax, thank God. And then Hans Rosling and his TED Talks, right? <laughs> or Steven Pinker, like those, those guys. You know, and then someone comes in, pisses on the parade and is like, yeah, but what about this other shit? And you're like, ah, oh, fuck that stuff again, dolphins. Yeah, it's crazy making. And then how about anybody in a psychedelic or contemplative experience and you're like, actually, no, this is, this is absolutely okay. This is unfolding as it must. This, is, this too is part of the plan. Has anybody had that experience of kind of, you know, non-dual transcendent equanimity? <laughs> yeah. And how on earth do we hold all that? Right? How on earth do we hold all that? So, so, yeah, I mean, we've been, we've been riffing on some of these things. I don't think we need to go deeply into it. Um, other than um, we've talked about, I mean, I don't want to repeat the conversation we had on Thursday night, which was about belief systems. 
uh, and those notions of rapture ideologies. I think one of the other tricky ones is the techno-utopianism, because that is so deeply baked as a script. And if has anybody heard any lately, people trot out the old chestnut of, oh, in the 1890s, we thought we were, you know, we were literally up to our knees in horseshit in London and New York City. And then they invented the car and that saved us. Don't worry, we'll fix this too, right? I mean, there's the, that, that one is, has become an absolute trip. And you're like, yeah, absolutely. That's a great example. And horse manure has a half-life of about 14 days. <laughs> we are dealing things with a bit more of a hangover. Right? We're dealing with things with literally thousands of years in their half-lives. So those are some of the tricks and some of the challenges. So if you ever find people, um, what I notice is that when, um, when people are doing this, there's, there's a consistent pattern of kind of denial. And one is, okay, we'll do the consciousness thing, right? And then you're like, well, look at the Tibetan lamas, right? The Tibetan lamas were woke as fuck, right? And 17-year-old Chinese kids with rusty Kalashnikovs could wipe out a thousand years of Dharma just by pulling a trigger. The ghost dance Lakota warriors, right, in the 1890s, right, literally would go into the peyote ceremonies, would be convinced that they would become invisible if they wore the ghost dance shirts, the, the, the cavalry's bullets would not hit them. And a, you know, a Gatling gun repeating howitzer mowed them down in short order. So for those folks that are posting up in Costa Rica, you know, Pura Vida, you know, setting up, you know, or Bali or these places with like histories of colonial oppression, life is cheap, machetes are sharp. You know, look at Zimbabwe, go back to those studies, like study our history, actually think what is actually happening when conditions decohere and do not think that we're special cupcake. You know, like history does repeat. So if I haven't thoroughly inspired you yet, Well, no, I, I will say this now, I, I will probably end up saying this quote so many times because it literally, it, it, it's, it is my North Star at this point, uh, which is the poet and, and activist, well, he's not even an activist, he's a curmudgeon, but he's a badass, um, Wendell Berry, uh, who, you know, way back in the 60s, had a literary career in New York City, and he basically, he said, well, fuck it, this isn't legit. And he went back to his family home place on his farm in Kentucky. And he lives in a town with 600 people in it. And he continues to write. He doesn't have a computer. He writes by typewriter. He's an absolute, you know, he, he is an icon of this land-based, human-based movement. And he has a poem called The Mad Farmer's Manifesto, which I would highly recommend reading. It's, it's crazy prescient. I mean, it's basically the first half is like, unplug yourself from being a socially defined zoo animal. But there's a line in the middle where he says, be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. And so to link that back to the Oliver Wendell Holmes, right, I care not a whit, you know, <laughs> or I, I, not, I, I don't give a fig for the, the simplicity on this side, but I care deeply, I'd give my life for the simplicity on that side. I think we can kind of conflate those two quotes and say, I don't give a damn about the happy thoughts on this side of facing the facts. I would give my life for the joy on the other side of facing the facts. Because here's the thing, right? Part one was, hey, it's likely to destabilize. And obviously, I mean, Brexit, you know, uh, UK elections, I mean, US elections, all of it, right? And this is, these are in the, this is in the high watermark democracies, right? It is getting far worse, far faster everywhere else. One of our friends is a former uh, Special Forces uh, US guy, and he just came back from Mexico. He just came back from Cancun. And we were actually, we were surfing together. And uh, he's like, and everybody's hanging out, partying, having a great time. And he's like, uh, yeah, you guys have no fucking idea what it's like in the rest of the world right now. Because he's doing private security and he travels the world. He has to get his adrenaline fix. It's a little bit of a dark thing, you know, like he gets twitchy when he comes out off duty. So he goes back into the war zones as a private mercenary security, you know, security guy for high net worth, politicians, families, etc. And he's like, it is a shit show everywhere else in the world. And the projection of force is what is the only thing holding things together. Right, so this idea of we might do everything we can 
and not all of us are going to make it. There's seven and a half, soon to be eight billion of us. Right, that's twice as many as when we grew up, when we were born. That is mind-bending. It's not just nostalgia to go, oh, well, back in the day, we used to go to the beach and it looked like this, or we used to have this little lake house and it was fantastic, and we were the only ones sailing our little boat. It's true. And if we think about the psychic impact of these things, let alone the ethical and actual demographics of it, just think psychic impact for a moment. Right? 3,000 people went down in the World Trade Centers, right? seared into the memory right, of the West. Less than a million refugees from Syria have effectively crashed the European Union and potentially the United Kingdom. The UN projects 100 million climate refugees in the next 10 years. <coughs> right? The build the wall, the Central and South American caravans, right? This is what, this is our world. And how do we stay open to that without just collapsing? How do we manage the psychic load? And like I said, that sounds incredibly selfish, right? I'm sitting here on my flat screen TV learning more than I choose to about the suffering of people in the developing world. Poor me, how will I manage? But even that, just that, is substantial. Right. So I think that's the trough, folks. After this, we come to the happy place. But it, it's a galvanized happy place, because the thing is, is that I am constitutionally unable, you might have detected this already, I am constitutionally unable to spout platitudes, right? Which is a son of a bitch, because it means I have to keep going into the mud and keep digging for the lotus flower in the hopes that I have something halfway worthwhile to share. So I wouldn't have done that if we didn't come to the other side of something that is actually potentially durable, potentially useful, right? And that thing is this. Um, this is, I think, this little guy's name. This was Tim Ferriss. I, I, absolutely, it was his fault. He sent this out in one of his newsletters. He's like, this is an amazing TED Talk. It made me cry. And I'm like, oh, cool, okay, made, me, made Tim cry, maybe it'll make me cry, that's great. Clicked on it, and I'm like, hey, kids, let me make my kids watch it, maybe they'll open their hearts, maybe we'll all cry together, it'll be a great family night. And um, this kid is named Sam, I think Sam Berners, and he was born with a congenital uh, defect, he knew he was going to die, effectively. And he's given a little, a TEDx talk, it wasn't even on the main stage, and, and it has 30 million views. And he is plucky, he is funny. He is filled with piss and vinegar. He likes rap. He wanted to be in the marching band. He was only 55 pounds soaking wet, so they created a special little drum so he could go out and play. He had all these dreams that he wanted to live, and he lived full on with no regret. And that little guy on a side stage TEDx in New Jersey, right, rippled around the world with his testament to being alive. And that power, that absolutely asymmetrical power, right, is what Gandhi, out of the, out of the Sanskrit tradition called Satyagraha, right, which in, in that tradition was alignment of self and action with truth. MLK popularized it, right, as soul force. Both of them leveraged it, right, for some, the most potent social justice movements of the 20th century. They took that deeper stand. They said, this is who we are. Damn the consequences. With love in our hearts, not hate. This isn't suicide by cop. Right? This is, we are brothers and sisters. This is, this is Obi-Wan Kenobi, cut me down, Vader. Right? I'll only come back stronger. Because this is it. I mean, this is washed out, sadly. But here, for those of you that remember, this is the old Robin Williams film, Dead Poets Society. It gave a lot of Americans a nostalgic hit for English boarding schools. This, this, was, um, this was before Harry Potter. I mean, they had to do with something. Um, 
this is that moment, right, where everything's gone sideways, and I think the, the young star has hung himself tragically, and, and Robin Williams is about to be run out of the school by the headmaster, and then all the boys stand up on the desk and say, and recite the poem, Oh, oh Captain, my Captain. And they do it knowing there's hell to pay. Right? They do it as a testament to how they've been moved by their teacher. The middle one is, you know, that's Susan Sarandon and, uh, gosh, what is her name? Gina Davis. All right, cornered at the edge of the Grand Canyon. If you guys remember that story, I think maybe Gina Davis had been raped earlier and then they'd end up killing someone who had tried to rape them again. They were pinned down. Harvey Keitel is the sort of FBI, the sympathetic FBI officer who gets it, but the rest of them is just fucking locking and loading and doing the thing they're gonna, they know they have to do in these situations. And they're like, there's no way. There's no way that patriarchal system that broke our hearts, that put us in this mess, there's no way we're submitting to that again. All right? She said, do you want to just do it? Do you want to just go? And that, you right, I mean, think about that. I mean, we all know that film. It's the first time we realized how fucking sexy Brad Pitt was. Right? And the final one, which is potentially, you know, the most germane to us these days, is Titanic. Not the film, <laughs> the actual story, right? And this is that string quartet. And they, and they, they realize, and in, in they survey the scene. They're like, it's women and children first. And there's not enough lifeboats for all of us. And that hole is big. The night is dark. Right? And the water is cold. So we can scrap for our place in line. Right? Or we can, we can seek refuge in our dharma. We can seek refuge in the thing we're actually here to do, which is make art. So they sit down, they compose themselves, and they play, Near am I God to thee. And we remember that. We remember Leonidas and the 300, right? Against 10,000 Persians. Like, think of the, the immortality of these moments. It's not just 30 million hits on TED Talk, right? This shit ripples. Think of the meme of Jesus. Not the idea, not which version of it we believe, just the notion that memetically all of them have been true for 2,000 years and have shaped history, right? In a way that beggars the imagination. And ultimately, the Cathars, right? Most people are familiar with the Templars, right? They were the sort of ones who supposedly got the secrets of King Solomon's temple in Jerusalem, became the adepts who came back from the Crusades and just ran the table in Europe, right? They were soldiers, they were, they were, they were warriors, they were financiers, they were strategists, and they were mystics. But they had some kissing cousins that were the Cathars, and they were even more rad. All right, in fact, they were so awake that every, every town and village that hosted them defended them at risk of their own life, as did the Templars. The Spanish Inquisition ginned up specifically to go and shut them down. But rather than submitting to the rack, rather than submitting to the horrors of the Inquisition, and their final stand in this castle in the south of France, they chanted and prayed themselves into ecstatic trance and leapt into the bonfire flames themselves. Normally, right, that kind of power is reserved for fucking lunatic jihadis, right, bent on destruction, animating from fear and hate. What's possible if we can initiate ourselves in joy and love? Right, it's the samurai notion of meditate on the thousand ways you may die. So that when it comes time to take your stand on the field, you do not flinch. And that's not macabre. That's not morbid. That is not a death wish. Paradoxically, 
having no regrets, having no hesitation, knowing what my life is for actually massively increases the odds of us getting out of this in a good way. Right? And the final example of this, I mean, I'm sharing these examples because hopefully one, is one, one or more lands for you. You know, I can feel galvanizing, feel hope-filled. Uh, but my advisor in graduate school uh, was a Lakota elder. He was also a Yale lawyer. And if anybody's familiar with Leonard Peltier, has anybody heard of like free Leonard Peltier? It was a rally. He was a Lakota that was set up by the FBI in the early 70s and put in prison during one of these earlier American Indian movement um, conflicts. Um, but he, he told the story of the Lakota warrior society, the Owl and Sash Society. And they were kind of the ballers around camp, right? That was like the baddest ass warrior club to be in. And, and they had their sash for a reason, which is when they, when they took the battlefield, not every time, but in the absolute mission critical times, they would, their sash was tied around their waist and then they would tie it to their lance and they would spike the lance into the ground and they would basically be yoked to that spot. And it meant either I'm the last man standing or today's a good day to die. And that stand, right, is arguably the stand we all need to make for ourselves, with each other. But there's a beautiful twist to that. The only way out of that almost certain death sentence was to have another member of the Owl Society release their brother. So what's possible with these metaphors, right? We don't need to fumble blindly into the future, right? We've got, right, the answers are always in the text. The answers are always in our culture. We have these examples. Humans have been doing this. They have been sending out pulses of satyagraha. We've been feeling the ripples of soul force. It anchors us, it inspires us, it mobilizes us, but we so often just forget it or it gets kind of lost in the shuffle. But it's an initiatory process. It cannot be faked. And how might we do that? And we'll, you know, we can talk about that a bit more this afternoon. So well, let me just, I, before we get into a little bit more practical, how are you guys doing? Let's just do an emotional, conceptual pulse check. Okay? Is this okay? Yeah. I mean, this is so much in the realm of like, sorry, not sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, so things to do, because obviously it's, no, it's not helpful just to scare the shit out of people and leave them fibrillating. It's to galvanize, right? <laughs> Be joyful. Right? Like that little kid, Sam. Be joyful, though we have considered the facts. So the first is prioritization. Um, this is a picture from Pompeii. And I've always thought, man, like, as we've been kind of watching this trend, you know, you're like, are we a Jewish family in Berlin in 33? Or 37? 39, oh, Christo not too late. Are we there in Pompeii, caught reading the paper? On the Sunday morning, it all went down, turned to ash. That thing was going off, the thing was smoking and belching for weeks. Right? This one is an especially egregious case study. Guy literally died with his dick in his hand. Which, you know, either meant he was a compulsive wanker or decided, fuck it, I'm going out with a bang. <laughs> so no matter what, let's not be that guy. And this one, um, I'm not through this yet. I feel like I keep getting like ratcheted further and further along. Um, but is the idea of like, at what point do, accept, do we accept what we must do? You know, and in Campbell's Hero's Journey, this is the belly of the whale. Uh, this is the backstory for Jonah, right? Jonah is um, 
you know, given the memo by God to go and save the wayward people of Nineveh next door. And he's like, nah, man, I'm a successful businessman. I got shit to do. I got game. Son, you have to wait. I don't want to do that. And God's like, nah, man, you got to go do that. He's like, nah, I don't want to do that. And he's like, mm, you got to do that. And he's like, ah, oh, fuck it, I'm running away. <laughs> so he hops the slow boat to China. The storms come up. The sailors freak out. Bad luck. Shut down Jonah eaten by the Leviathan, and there he is in the dark night of the soul. He's like, okay, 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 I get it. Three days later, spat out, right, and goes and does what he must. All right, Maslow is well known for his hierarchy, uh, but he also had this idea of the Jonah complex, which he borrowed from this myth, which is that we are actually, you know, and Marianne Williamson has thoroughly buggered this one up, but, you know, the idea that we are actually afraid of our own greatness. We are afraid of our call to deep, transformative purpose, to fully surrendered leadership. For two reasons, at least in Maslow's uh, understanding or articulation, which was number one, could I keep that up? Has anybody had a profound, transformative, ecstatic experience? And then somehow, unconsciously or subconsciously, let the air back out of the balloon? Right? It's like almost famous where the dude's standing, tripping balls, standing on the roof. He's like, I am a golden god. I'm on drugs. <laughs> right? Owning our full power is terrifying. Because it requires us to live up to and into everything, you know, all that we've been shown. It requires setting aside the childish things. Besides, it requires no longer self-sabotaging no longer bailing to our comforts and our conveniences and our indulgements and our addictions and our, you know, pro our projections and our distractions. And the other part, right, that's the first part, internal. The other part's external, back to socially defined. It's like, what would my family or the neighbors think? They're not going to let me get away with this. I fit in a tidy little box in their world. I suddenly show up upsetting all of our collective apple carts. I'm going to make people feel uncomfortable. I'm going to threaten them. I'm going to stress them out. I'm going to scare them. They're either going to be freaked out or they're going to be you know, dismissive or derisive. But it's not going to be fun. I promise that. No one's going to say, thank you so much. Really glad. That was a wonderful inspiration. I think I'll do the same. You know, and in the New Testament, it's that story of the Nazarene going to the Sea of Galilee, and I think, I don't know, it's always one of those classical mouthfuls. It's like James and John and Peter called Zebedee or some, you know, like one of those. But it's like th four, three or four dudes, and they've just bought two new fishing boats, and they're out in the Sea of Galilee. They've got new nets, the whole bit. And Jesus is like, yeah, no, nah, no, nah, guys. And they're like, look at us. We're doing it. We're kicking ass. We're finally going to make it. And he's like, nah. When are you going to put down your nets and come and be fishes of men? So for all of us, the answer to that question right, is uniquely personal, but weirdly, it's getting transpersonal. All right? Marshall McLuhan famously said, the personal is political. That became the rallying cry of the 60s. But the transpersonal right, is political even more so. And how do we answer this question? I know for myself, I've had that one in the corner of my eye, back in my vision. I've been dodging it for as long as I possibly can. Let me just make this amount of money to make sure my kids can go to college, make sure they have a safe place to be, make sure everything can be sorted, and then if I have to, then okay, I will. But please let me tie up all the loose ends. Please make sure that if I have to do something hairy or scary, that it won't affect anybody else I love. And while that sounds noble and beautiful, and it's, again, back to evolutionary bio, it's hard encoded in all of us. If I really sat in front of the burning bush, would the answer not be that too is an attachment of your ego? That too is a false presumption that you control far more than you ever could? And what does truly surrendering into all of this actually look and feel like? Because it's scary, super scary. Feedback I often get in conversations like this, I mean, a little bit less in the last year or so, because I've just been, I'm sort of officially out of fucks. I actually, it was actually a specific 
workshop trauma thing that I went through and I'm like, okay, I accept my yoke. Like, so there was a legit pivot point for me in this last year, but it's not done. And it was that sense of connecting head and heart. Because when we actually do both together, then it's Satyagraha. We invoke the archetype. We take our stand. And dear God, man, that is really, really hard and really uncertain and scary. Until, right? Until we do this. Until we walk each other home. And then, man, it becomes like a roving dance party, right? I mean, we sort of like, I've been down so goddamn long, like going down the road feeling bad. Don't want to be treated this way. But someone's singing it, someone's dancing it, and we're like, oh, fuck yes. This, this, right? The redemption songs that lift us up again and again. What is, I wanna, oh, that was that, okay. So the next thing, um, this is tactical, but the intention of this bit is to advocate moving beyond the binaries. Because the binary I've experienced, and I think, you know, maybe nod or whatever, if, if others of you have, is, is the, the pillar to post of, is this shit or go blind territory? Right, in which case I should change everything in my life. I should reorganize all of my priorities effective yesterday. Or if that's too much to wrap my head around, there's too much uncertainty, there's too much, it's just, it's, I'm not there yet. Back to, I guess I'm not gonna do anything and I'm gonna keep kind of going the way yesterday was. And that sort of fibrillation and exhaustion and confusion defaulting back to the norm is where it feels like an awful lot of well-intentioned folks are, but it's not free, right? Because every time we do that, we're juiced to the gills and of hypervigilance response. We, we have a sense of urgency. We have cortisol. We have all kinds of things eating us alive and priming us for the moment. And then we're like, stand down. But part of us isn't really standing down. And the algorithms help. They looked on what we've clicked on. They looked on what we double clicked and read. They just keep serving more shit up that's all the same. Right? We can't get away from it. So what I would absolutely advocate is the Pareto split on taking the next steps. It's too soon to go all in on anything right now and probably misguided. But what we can absolutely encourage is to say, do the 20% of the things you think you might now that will save or protect or preserve 80% of the things you care about and value next. That gives us agency. That gives us forward motion. That gives us a sense of things to do. And so what might that look like? Um, and people might say, you know, back to the spiritual sect, it's like, oh, I don't want to bring that kind of fear and negativity into my vortex. <laughs> like, fuck you. It's coming anyway. Right? Your vortex is about to be overwhelmed by a tsunami. So this is, Lao, this is Sun Tzu. Better to be a warrior in the garden than a gardener in the war. So we're still in our gardens. We're blessed. For now. Amen. Right? Train. Train. So I think simple stuff. I, my background is in mountain guiding, so I get down to brass tacks very, very quickly as far as like, what are the like reality filters? And the reality filters, do you have water purification? Do you have fuel? Do you have food? Can you, do you have shelter? Do you have layers and protection? Can you sleep warm and dry? Can you drink water? Do you have calories? Do you have a map, communications, and medical gear and equipment? to traverse the terrain you're in. If you have those things, you can handle all kinds of shit shows and uncertainties and actually have a blast doing it. Miss even one of those things and you get yanked down the hierarchy of needs quicker than you can imagine and suddenly any of your objectives are trashed and you're back to, now how do we get back to refilling one of those things as soon as possible? So this is presumably a gathering of leaders. 
right? And one of the most profound lessons I ever got was from uh, an Everest MD. So, you know, base camp, dealing with all that kind of stuff. And he was training us as uh, wilderness EMTs, which sort of, I don't know what the classifications are in the UK, but sort of a paramedic -y kind of thing, um, but also for the, for the backcountry. So not dialing 911 and triggering emergency services, but you know, you're building traction splints out of skis and that kind of thing. Um, and he said, and you know, and it's really empowering stuff and I'll make a case for that for, you know, for everyone in a moment, but the natural thing is you start, if you're practicing your training, you're kind of going through real scenarios and you're fishing, you know, doing, doing drills on the mountains or in the river and fishing people out and it feels great. You're like, wow, I'm beginning to feel competent, right? I'm beginning to feel like I can be part of solutions. And he's like, not so fast, not so fast. He said, when you have these skills, it's me first, me second, me third, my partner's fourth, the victim fifth. And you're like, what? That sounds unconscionably selfish. No, I want to go help. And he's like, no, nah, look, if you go, if there's an avalanche and you go running in there, not checking to see if there's about to be another one that's coming down on top of that, all right? You have not put yourself in the way of danger. You're right there about to become another victim. And who has to look after that other victim? Your partners. What happened to all that knowledge that you had and the victims didn't have gone, right? If you're a fireman and you go into a burning building but you haven't decided, you haven't asserted whether the structure is stable and isn't gonna collapse on you, you are creating additional hazard. So lose the cape, right? And the other, the other just embodied one that came up with that is, if you're the most informed person in the situation, and obviously if you know somebody's broken, they've fallen, fallen out of a car accident or a tree or, or a mountain or whatever, you know, the, one of the first things you do is stabilize the head, right? In case there's a you know, spinal injury. So you, you get there and you stabilize the head. The only trouble is, is that once you're on the head, you can never let go until they're actually on a backboard fully strapped down, which is often, you know, an hour or more away. So if you're the most experienced person, you come rushing in and you do the thing that is needed to be done next, you're out of the game. When you're down at ground level, you've got no perspective and you can't actually help manage the incident from the elevation you need to. So for us, right, rather than thinking, I will be a gardener in the war, right? I think it's really critical for us to take the steps. And that would be literally very simply, you know, look into solar power, look into having a well, look into basic wilderness medical training. And that's not because you necessarily plan on living in a bunker in the mountains. It's to say when emergency medical services go down, right? We are needed. And by the way, there's not a single one of these recommendations that I'm making now that I didn't make to our students 20 years ago. Because it's just simple grown ass human shit. And it's profoundly empowering, a ton of fun, right? And you can't lose having done it. So like what happens if I do the 20% of prep and the world just keeps trucking on? Awesome. My lights aren't powered by coal fire or nuclear plants, right? Julie has saved us thousands of dollars in plastic surgery bills and stitches, right? Because she knows how to patch up her kids and her family and me and herself um, by, you know, without going to the doctor. The number of times that she has helped friends of ours or us and then we finally have gone to the doctor because something was gnarly enough and they're like, oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not undoing that. That's perfect, right? So just and, we would have prefects in a boarding school that we used to teach at take the wilderness medical training because it was the single most psychoactive tool to advocate situational awareness, right, anti-fragility, and leadership skills. So never mind using the tools, right? You will have kids, right? How beautiful is it to say, I mean, how many people have ever fantasized about the cruising lifestyle on a yacht, like taking your kids around the world on a sailboat or, or, or taking them to a farm, anything that gives them like a little bit more experience in life in the world, right? How about, this is the battery, this is the energy, turn off your lights, not because I keep saying so, but turn off your lights because look what happens. Do a square foot garden in the back garden. Worst case is you have fresh herbs for your cooking, right? <laughs> not such a bad thing. So take the steps, 
right? That just empower us and kick us out of fragmented, deconditioned, zoo animal consumers. Full stop. And then we're not the ones waiting, queuing for water at the fire department or at the hospital. We're the ones able to be standing and still functional as leaders. Because here's the spectrum. The spectrum is me, mine, now. Can I look after myself? It's biohacking, optimal psychology. Am I, do I have nutrition? Do I have health? Do I have basic, decent, you know, can I stand on my own two feet? If I can stand on my own two feet and I've still got gas in my tank, can I look after my family? Great. If I can do that, I've got gas in the tank. Can I look after my Dunbar community, up to 150 people? Fantastic. After that, still extra, my country. After that, still extra, the world. And that's fluid and flexible. It's going to depend on conditions. If I suddenly have a concussion, back to the bottom of the slide. Right? If I haven't eaten for three days, back to the bottom of the slide. Right? So it's a sliding scale, and there's a time component as well, which is me and mine now. That's us in a refugee camp. That's us after a plane crash. Right? Something gnarly. Boom. Tunnel vision. Naturally. All the way to everyone, everywhere, everywhere. Right? True bodhisattva, all sentient beings, playing the longest of games. All right. Time. Am I aware of time? I'm completely unaware of time. Where are we? Is this 10 to 11? 10 to 12? Is that where we are? Sweet Jesus. All right. That's it. I'll leave us with this then. Um, which is the notion of grief and the, and, the, and the requirement to metabolize it. So I think the simplest way to think of it is, is weep. Don't whimper. Get rid of all the neurotic, egoic distractions. Right? Grieve the real stuff, the human condition. Get it out. And then get back up. Shakespeare said in, in Julius Caesar, right? He said, a, a coward dies a thousand deaths, the valiant but once. And I think I shared this, I'll leave with this. This was E.B. White, the author of Charlotte's Web. And he said, each morning I wake up torn between the desire to save the world and savor it. But then I realized that the savoring has to come first. Because if I didn't savor this world, there would be nothing left worth saving. All right, folks. Thank you very much.